Speed, full camera. Yeah, let's do that for now. All right, Calgary, let me know if you can hear me okay. Um, and then we'll get started pretty quickly. Uh, the echo is real. I have no idea how to deal with audio issues. Can someone... There's like a, uh, a bad echo coming through. Hey, James. Apparently there's an echo on the microphone. Do you know how to deal with that? <laughs> oh, just, oh, uh, I fixed it, yay. You're getting a feedback loop. Yeah, I have no idea why that was happening. I didn't do anything, but it's fixed. That's awesome. Okay. All right. Is everyone in Vancouver here and ready? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so I feel bad about uh, Calgary getting left out yesterday. So I made a little surprise to make sure that everyone gets included. Um, I'm just going to have to refresh here. Uh, but... Let's see. So I've got my Calgary. Is this the right channel? I just have to make sure it's the right one. Yes, full-time Calgary. Good to go now. I'm just going to post in a little script here. OK. I think that should be good. Someone, one person from Calgary, um, send a message through Slack. I just have to wait. Hey. All right, you can send another message if you want. It doesn't know how to say emojis. <laughs> uh, so, Calgary, did you did you see that? Wow, well, that science going too far. <laughs> <laughs> so now, every time you comment, this hand is going to wave past my face, and my laptop is going to yell whatever you typed in. And it only applies to this channel, so we won't get all the feedback from the other channels. Yeah. Can we set it as the voice of Alfred from Bat Batman? It seems like something that we should do. Maybe let's do it during the break in case it takes like 10 minutes. Um, I don't know how, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. But yeah, all right. Everyone happy? I'm pretty happy with that. I wasn't sure if this would work, and it did, and it works perfectly. I'm officially impressed A+. Plus. I don't even need to do a lecture now. This is like, this is JavaScript. Actually, this is all done in JavaScript, which is kind of cool. And I'd love to show you the code, but uh, maybe for an advanced lecture. Um, I don't think that's a good idea, Dave. <laughs> this, don't make me turn it off. Uh, OK, so today we're talking about client-side JavaScript. And before we do that, I'm going to redo the cameras. Uh, See, split screen. OK, today we're talking about client-side JavaScript. Um, everyone good and ready now? That wasn't too distracting? No? OK. Um, so this is the JavaScript that runs within our browsers, right? Uh, last week, we wrote JavaScript that wrote, uh, ran on the server. The week before that, we were kind of just writing JavaScript functions, playing around with the language. Today is when we actually uh, start writing JavaScript in the way that it was first intended. JavaScript was created to run within the browser. So this is like where JavaScript originated, which is really cool. Um, the reason we have JavaScript in the browser is so that we can add behavior to our client-side applications without it always having to make a round trip to the server. So think about last week. Every time uh, anything had to happen, every time a, a tiny URL got added or deleted, or you had to change something on the screen, like just go to a new page or something, you had to make a complete round trip to the server. Um, you had to make a GET or a POST request that would result in the entire page being torn down and brand new HTML being added to the page, uh, which is kind of a, a lot of work going on um, when you just want to do like little things. Like maybe you want to add uh, a new message to like a Twitter app, or maybe you want to add a new to-do to a to-do list or something. Um, so you don't really want to be tearing down the entire page, making uh, an HTTP request that gets you an entire new page and loading that. Um, for the user. It would be kind of like you know, you're wanting to change the background color or the, uh, the wall color of this building. 
Uh, and instead of just painting over what's currently here, you tear down the entire building and rebuild it with the new color. Uh, it's a super inefficient way of doing things. So using client-side JavaScript, we can uh, accept user input and use that to update the things that the user are seeing on the screen without having to make that round trip to the server and, and completely rebuild the entire screen. So um, I've got to keep everything on the same screen now to make sure that this works. Uh, today, let's see. I'm going to be spending most of my time, at least in the first half of lecture, uh, in the console. All right, everyone's opened this up and knows how to get to the console. Yeah, um, this is great. Uh, you can see that these are all the issues with uh, with Compass, which is kind of bad. Um, when you open up the console, you get all the console logs and any console errors, uh, and it looks like WebSockets is not currently working uh, in Compass for me anyway. Um, but when we open up the console, we can interact with any web page. So in one sense, it's kind of like our REPL. Um, when we open up a node REPL, I can just create variables, uh, var high equals hello. But I can also interact with this web page here. So I could start using JavaScript to manipulate this website. Uh, one of the easiest things you can do is create an alert which will just pop up on the screen. We can see now uh, web.compass is giving me an alert for hello. Um, so this is a really good place to start experimenting with JavaScript, realizing how the technologies work in JavaScript. Um, so the first things I want to talk about are the global variables, JavaScript global variables. What can anyone tell me about global variables in JavaScript? Calgary. Uh, they can be applied anywhere in the uh, module. They, they can what? They can be applied anywhere in the module, like as variables. Oh, yeah, like they can be used anywhere. Uh, I won't say module because modules is something that we use in Node, but not in the browser, not by default anyway. Uh, global variables can be used anywhere, they are global. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know anything about global variables? Come on, we've we've at least uh, learned like how to not create global variables or how to create them. No. We shouldn't be creating them. We shall. I, the, the voice is awful. We shouldn't be creating them. Absolutely. Uh, we shouldn't be creating them. I'll write that down. We shouldn't be creating them. Why not? Yeah, do you have another? What's that? They are variables that are accessible within any block. Yeah, variables that are accessible literally anywhere. So when we create a variable, when we create a, a var variable, uh, what is the scope of that variable? Um, okay, this is a little bit of review then. Uh, so when we create a variable, variables uh, scope is a function. So variables are function scoped. Const, const, and let, I'm having trouble typing, uh, are scoped to blocks, or are block scoped. So uh, a block being like literally that. So an if statement uh, would include a block, or a for loop, or a while loop, or a function even. Um, but uh, these are always going to be these variables are always going to be scoped within either a function or a block, as long as we define them within a function or within a block. But what happens if we create a variable not inside of a function or inside of a block? What happens if we create a variable just out in the open in this global scope? It becomes a global variable, exactly, yeah. Uh, in Node, we know that if we create uh, anything within a file, that file is wrapped within a function, so everything becomes function scoped, uh, or everything is scoped to the file because everything is function scoped. But in the browser, not everything is wrapped in a function, not by default anyway. So if we create a variable out in this global scope, it becomes a global variable, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, so if I actually wanted to scope a variable, I would have to put it inside a function. Oh, God. Sometimes writing code on multiple lines within the uh, the console 
doesn't work well. Whatever, you get the point. I'm not sure what that's complaining about. Um, anyway, but there are some global objects by default that we will take advantage of. So we don't want to be creating our own global variables, but sometimes there are global variables that we need to use, that we need accessible no matter where we're writing our code, no matter which function or block. Uh, does anyone know which global objects we have access to in the browser? Document. document is one. So no matter where I am in my code, I can use the document object. What else? Window. What else? Is that? Header. header? Nope, not header. Nope. Now, there are a, a, a few. Um, for example, you know, we can use console. So console would be a global object with a log property that we can use and call as a function. Whoops. Um, but the main global object, like, yeah, so. And it's not coming through? <gasps> I wrote some crappy JavaScript. The hand stopped working, colon, disappointed, colon. <laughs> EG window just didn't work for some reason. I don't know why. But, uh,. Wait, EG window, yes. Uh, yeah, the window uh, is accessible. The window is actually the global object. Um, so the interesting thing about this is in Node there is a global object and it's called global. Like we can literally write the word global in Node and access this global object. We can't do this in the browser. But every time we uh, create a global variable, it gets assigned as a property to the global object. So window. In the browser, window is the global object. Every time we create a global variable, it gets, uh, gets attached to the global object as a property. So if I have created this global variable, uh, or if I create a new global variable, I don't know, var dog equals Otis. This is a global variable, which means that it's a property now on the window object. Window.dog, Otis. Document is another global object, which means that it is a property on the global window object. So document is the same as window.document. Uh, window.console.log. So anything that is now a global variable exists as a property on the window object, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so if you ever accidentally create a global variable or you intentionally want a global variable, it's going to exist on the window object, or you can make it exist on the window object to be uh, global. So for example, if I really wanted something to be global, no matter what my scope was, I could say like window dot uh, my variable equals jazz hands, and now I have access to my variable everywhere within my code. It's kind of a funny behavior of JavaScript, yeah. Uh, so we'll get to yeah, we'll get to document in a, in a minute. Um, so out of all the global objects we have access to, the ones that we're most concerned with today are going to be window, navigator, and document. The window object, like I said, is the global object. Uh, but what does it represent? Like each of these objects is a JavaScript object that represents something. What does the window represent? Uh, Obvious answer would be like the window. Uh, the browser, not the entire browser, not like Chrome as a browser. Any other guesses? Something to do with the size. So there's like, uh, yeah, window inner width, uh, window outer width, outer width. Um, this will give me the size of like the viewport on the left here. This will give me the size of the entire window. 
but it represents the current window I have open, or in newer browsers, the current tab I have open. So something like window.location will give me the actual address where I am. You can even use this uh, to redirect locally from the client side. You can just set the window.location to be something else uh, and get to a different web page. Um, so the window represents the represents the current open window, which is really just a tab now. Uh, the next thing we have is the navigator. What does the navigator object represent? Navigator. Is that like what? Routes. routes? That would be kind of a cool, yeah, if it was like navigating through routes. No, it's, uh, it's not to do with any routes or anything. It actually kind of dates back to one of the first browsers. What was the name of one of the first browsers? Oh. What's that? The browser yeah, it's the browser itself. Dates back to, I'm pretty sure this is true, uh, dates back to when um, the main browser was Netscape Navigator. So to refer to Netscape Navigator, you would type Navigator, and that would give you access to the browser. The cool thing about this is that the browser is a desktop application, and desktop applications have access to things like the hardware within the machine. So if I go through the Navigator object, I can figure out information or even manipulate some of the hardware on my currently running machine. So uh, for example, the Navigator will have information about um, my battery. Uh, so if I run get battery, which is a method, which is a returns a promise, which we are covering later week. So just I'm going to write some code. Um, but if I get things about the battery, I can get information like, is the user on my website currently charging their laptop? Uh, and what is the charge level, like 67? Yeah, it's at 67%. So you can figure out all this information about someone's stuff. You know, you can figure out if they have a camera, if they can play audio, things like that. Uh, you can even, if you had a Bluetooth device, like if you were creators of Fitbit or something, uh, you can interact from a browser to the device uh, using the navigator's Bluetooth properties. Uh, something to do with, yeah, Bluetooth. And then I think you can use that to then like scan for all the Bluetooth devices in the room. Uh, so that's kind of powerful, kind of cool. Nothing that we're going to use in boot camp, but definitely something good to know about. Know that this exists. There is this navigator object that is the entire browser. Browser. <laughs> oh, God. I, I prefer it to hummus. Um, navigator. The uh, entire browser application uh, can be used to access uh, hardware. Uh, which leaves us with the final one, and probably the most important one for us anyway, as, as client-side developers, the document. What is the document object? One answer was all the HTML. If I type document in here and hit this little arrow, that looks like the HTML, doesn't it? So yeah, the document is uh, all of the HTML. It's our entry point to the DOM. Dum, dum, dom. Everyone heard of DOM? What does DOM stand for? Document object model. And it's like the, the main thing we care about today and every time we're dealing with JavaScript on the client side. Um, so yeah, the document allows us to actually interact with our HTML. Uh, I can see here that the document represents all of the HTML. That's why it evaluates to this in the browser. Uh, but it also has a lot of methods and properties that we're going to use to interact with our actual uh, HTML. So um, let's see, the document has a body property that we can use to interact directly with the body. That's where we see all our visual stuff. The document has methods that allow us to create new elements, create element, yep, create new elements within our browser. Uh, so if I just wanted to add maybe another list item here, I could create an element using the document object and then insert it into the document. So the document is really where we're going to be living today and the rest of this week and every time we're manipulating the DOM, which is one of the reasons we write uh, client-side JavaScript. Um, so those are the three global variables, emphasis on the document. Any questions so far? Calgary? 
I just want to hear you talk, even if you don't have a question. Kind of wakes me up a bit every time I see that hand wave. What about the event object? Aha! What about the event object? Oh, I think it's because this one is lagged a little bit. What about the event object? We will get to events later. Like event, uh, which is not a global object, uh, but an object we use when we start handling events. Um, kind of like what we'll be getting to later is actually how users interact with our page. Those are called events. events. Uh, so let's talk about HTML and the DOM. Um, Let's kind of recap a little bit of yesterday. And to do that, let's make an HTML page. And Calgary, you give us our theme, our noun for today. I'm going to create a new HTML document while they're doing that. Index.html. How do I um, populate this with the boilerplate HTML5 code? Yeah, exactly. Um, let's add some stuff. Uh, let's add a heading. Come on, Calgary, I need a, I need a theme, I need a noun. Damn it, what is up with this lag? Poppies. I tested it out and the window didn't have to be present. I don't know, whatever. Puppies or potatoes, puppies, obviously. Or potatoes as well. How about like puppies, subheading, Potatoes. Potato. I want to write that, but that doesn't. Is that right? Yes. yes. Like, that doesn't seem like the right spelling of potatoes. Uh, let's throw in an image just because why not? Um, let's go to. Whoa. Let's go to philmurray.com. Um, and let's just take a calm picture of Phil Murray. Mg. Do I need to specify a alt tag for my images? Absolutely, yes, always. Like you, are, you don't have to. Your page will render if you don't specify an alt tag. But you should always, 100% of the time, populate this alt tag. Uh, calm Bill Murray. Uh, I didn't want to open Photoshop. That was an accident. OK, um, so we got puppies and we got potatoes. Uh, let's, let's make some lists of puppies and potatoes. That seems kind of odd. Whatever. Uh, so I'm going to make an unordered list. And inside here, we're going to make some list items. Uh, I don't know. Is there like types of puppy? Breed of puppy? Puppy names? Puppy emojis? What would be a nice thing to list for, for puppies? Or potatoes? OK, yeah. I thought, <laughs> I'm glad you ended with potatoes there. Yeah. Um, the sentence. <laughs> Was favorite ways to like things bake or make potatoes? Things that potatoes are made with. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So everyone's uh, like yell out your favorite um, potato. Potatoes. Boil them. Mash them. Stick them in a dolly. <laughs> Jesus. For SEO, yes, exactly. I need a better better script that actually yells this out at me more often. Um, uh, for more reasons than SEO, going back to the alt text, I really want to talk about this a little bit. Um, for so many other reasons, including like screen readers, people with uh, who can't actually like see the image, they'll actually get read what is in the image, um, and obviously SEO. What is the what? What is that? What is that? Let's have um, let's have my computer say it again. Type of potato. White Lonnie. Purple potato. All right, I'm just going to start copying and pasting. So we got purple potato. We got uh, boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Whoops. No. Scalloped. Anyone else? Boil them. Curly fries? What about like uh, yam fries? Sweet potato fries? Um, oh, hold on, I forgot what the old one was. Curly, curly fries. 
Uh, how do you spell Noki? Yeah? Sweet. Good enough. Vodka. Yeah. Um, there's probably a potato emoji. Nope, that's poop emoji. Good enough. Let's see, there's probably a potato emoji. Pote. Oh, yeah, there is. Look at that. Cool. All right. Uh, I think that's a pretty extensive list of what you would do with potatoes or things about potatoes. Calgary's typing. Um, it's actually, I'm going to put this in a section. Uh, maybe this will be like an article. Huh? No, no, the, the, the site is puppies, but then we'll have like, uh, so it's, it's a site that's called puppies. It has a picture of Bill Murray, and then we have an article with potatoes. Yeah, yeah, so put potatoes there. Um, yeah, right, imagine if we just had puppies. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Ugh. Okay, um, uh, do we want anything else? No, I think that's good. I think that's good for now, anyway. Um, let's see what it looks like. Let's see, where do I even have my code? Week three, day two. That's not right. Cool. Everyone happy with our beautiful looking site? Yes. Okay, puppies, Bill Murray, potatoes, nice. Okay. So, um, let's go back to our HTML. Does anyone have any questions about the HTML written here? Anything to do with uh, with the dark type or the HTML, head, body, tags, tags, tags? Um, what's at the top? The HTTP quiz. HTTP, where am I looking? Oh, this thing. Yeah. This is so that it looks OK on Internet Explorer and Edge. So this is like, uh, make it look OK on Microsoft's web browsers. Do you have to do that? Yeah. No. Yeah, it's kind of like just one of those things. Um, these are kind of the, the default things you should do. Make sure it looks OK <laughs> on Internet Explorer's stuff. Uh, make sure it looks good on mobile devices. Uh, make sure that your text gets encoded correctly and make sure it doesn't get rendered in quirks mode. Those are just things now we have to include to make sure that like our site is normal. Without that, it's not normal, which is annoying. Um, yeah, it's frustrating really, but oh well. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at the structure of this HTML because when the uh, developers of browsers needed to uh, be able to interact with HTML from their JavaScript, they needed a way of representing the HTML as JavaScript. So I need to be able to access this H1 in JavaScript somehow and be able to modify its contents, maybe remove it, maybe add new elements in there. So they had this challenge of how do we represent every single element on the page in JavaScript somehow, right? Like represent as a function, just as variables, or, or what do we do here? Uh, so, I'm going to try and use the whiteboard now. Let's see. If I drag the whiteboard over, it will cover my hand, but whatever. Let's see if this works out. Can you see the whiteboard, Calgary? Uh, I'm going to zoom out of my. All right, we can see the whole body. Sweet. So, Can everyone in here still kind of see the screen, or am I now in the way? Pretty in the way, whatever. We can, we can, we can pretend. We can just memorize what we had on that. Uh, so, every HTML document has uh, what's the yeah? What's the first tag we see in an HTML document? The doc type. The doc type. What's the first like official open closing tag that we see? HTML. HTML. And Calgary, you can, oh wait, I'm going to open up the thing so I can hear them. Yes. Sweet. <laughs> Damn it, they had to write yes three times before it came up. Oh, yeah, anyway. Um, within the HTML, how many tags are there inside? There are two. What are those two tags? Head and body. Within, 
head, how many tags are there? As many as you want. Uh, we currently have, you know, just a bunch of meta tags, whatever, I'll just write M, uh, and a title tag. Excuse the handwriting. Uh, inside the body, how many tags can we have? As many as we want. Inside of our body, even though it's covered up, how many tags do we have? Or what's like the first tag we have? Which is? H1. Then what? Image. Image. No, we didn't do another H1. No, I changed it from an H2 to. So you remember what I changed it to? Yep, article. Then what's inside the article? There's an H2, and there's an unordered list. And within the unordered list, there are many, many list items. Um, OK, that's kind of the end now. Um, can anyone tell me what this data structure is? It is the DOM. Does anyone know, anyone like with a bit of a comp sci background can tell me what this data structure looks like? It looks like a tree, right? For anyone that's unfamiliar. DOM hierarchy, yes. It's, people are looking at me, what funny. Uh, this is a uh, tree. Um, there are many trees within the things we interact with when coding. Uh, the DOM is a tree. File systems are trees. Uh, JSON that we get back from APIs are often trees. Uh, the cool thing about trees is that they are, um, sometimes they are complicated to deal with, but at the very basic level, they're just simple objects. Where you'd have an object that would maybe represent the HTML node. These are all called nodes. Uh, this would be the root node. And every node can have children, which are nodes themselves that can have children, which are also nodes themselves. So everything is just going to be a JavaScript object that can have these children that will also be JavaScript objects with children and so on. Uh, this would be the root node. These are all leaf nodes. Computer science scientists got the tree the wrong way around. Uh, but yeah, this is a tree structure. We will learn more about trees in week five, so I'm only going to kind of bring it up now. Um, but everything will be represented as a JavaScript object, which is nice, because we know how to deal with JavaScript objects, right? Yeah. So that was the solution to the problem. Make everything a JavaScript object and make everything a tree, make the DOM a tree. Um, so. I guess I could have done it like that. Calgary could probably see it if I'd done it like that too. Um, oh well. So, anyone have any questions about the DOM being a tree? Yeah, go. Ahead. So, could you access, say, like article by going document.html.body.article? So, the question was so, could I access article by going document.html.body.article? Uh, kind of. Kind of. Um, so let's actually answer that question in a really long way. Uh, so like I said, everything uh, in the DOM is a JavaScript object. So everything kind of has this structure. I'm going to simplify it. It kind of has this structure. So everything's an object that has uh, probably something, you know, like a, a tag name, right? That's going to be a, a string, maybe. Or maybe we'll just do an example one. So a tag name, maybe a body would be the tag name. Um, might have uh, some data, like uh, an image tag would have image data. Um, a p tag would have text data. Uh, maybe there's like class names and other attributes that we'd like to access. So I'm just going to kind of summarize it as, as saying data. But there might be lots of properties that we would access on a specific element. Um, then every element can have how many children? Like, like zero or more, right? Uh, what's a really good way in JavaScript of representing zero or more things? Hmm? 
But like, yeah, if I had many things, maybe zero things, or maybe like 10 things, or 1,000 things, just like zero to many things, uh, what data structure might I put them in? If I just have a bunch of things. Object. I could put them in an object. What else could I use? Arrays, right? Arrays are pretty handy for lists of things. So when we're dealing with the DOM, the children of, a, of an element, of a node, will be an array with other objects inside. So the body would have children, uh, maybe tag name, uh, what well, we have an h1 in there, some sort of data. Um, h1 doesn't have any children, so it would be an empty array, right? We can use arrays to represent zero or more values. Um, what else might there be? So we have an h1, we have uh, an image, we also have that article. would have some data. Um, and the article has children, has a single child. That is the unordered list, and so on and so on. Children, and I'm just going to kind of stop it there. Um, So there are any questions about that? Every single thing is a JavaScript object that we can access data from just using properties. But every single thing will have children that will be zero or more JavaScript objects that, again, will have children that will be zero or more JavaScript objects. Um, it's a recursive data structure. We get into it more in week five. But for now, it's just all we have to really think about are these JavaScript objects that have children. So if we take a look at an example of that, we've got our page up here. Uh, your question was, can I access like this list by going what document dot body dot article dot list whatever? Um, knowing what we know about this being a tree where children will be an array of other objects. I'm just making sure Calgary hasn't written anything. Cool. Um, how might I access, let's start with the entire list. Actually, no, let's start with, let's kind of go through, actually. So let's start with puppies. How might I access puppies just by traversing this tree? Uh, starting with the fact that I have document.body as a starting point. So I've got the body element as a starting point. How can I access the h1? Just click that little arrow, and it just gives you all. No, I mean, like, in JavaScript, how would I access the h1? Yeah, absolutely, dot children. So document.body is a node in the DOM, meaning it has little bits of data that I can access, but it also has children that is an array. Well, it's actually an HTML collection, but that's an array-like object. So for the purposes of today, we can treat it like an array. Um, document.body.children. How many children does the body have? Three. What is, actually, how do I access the h1? Right? Zero. Cool. Went to the body node, found its children, and went to the first child of the body node. Um, let's try something a little bit more complicated. Let's try this first list item. How do I get to the very first list item in our unordered list of potatoes? So the question was, is, it, um, is the order here, h1 image article, uh, the same order that it appeared on the screen? And yeah. Oh yeah, that's a really yeah, that's a really great thing. Um, so I'm just going to answer that uh, with a demonstration. Uh, what would happen if? So uh, originally this code, it didn't say anything. Oh, 
it's really funny uh, because the way I've got my code set up, it uh, it, it um, has no like escaping thing. So if you write valid JavaScript, it might actually try and execute that within my my thing, um, which might have happened. Anyway, uh, document dot query selector. Yes, <laughs> that's cool. Just don't write like. Um, Really don't write any any malicious bash script because that will mess up everything. Like, I don't even want to give you an example of what you shouldn't write because of that, that's scary. Uh, I I'm not sure because it's bash. Uh, it's still going to try and run it as a bash function. But if you were to be like you know uh, sudo remove everything from the hard drive, it just like it would do it. Um, so don't do that, please. Uh, yeah, OK, so it would ask me for my password. But still, but still, like, um, let's not hack Sam. <laughs> Document.body.children2.children1.children, whatever index you want in Lee. Awesome, Darren, yes. Um, we'll get back to that in a second. So what I did want to address first was uh, the way we're traversing this is kind of brittle. And we will come to a better solution in a moment. Um, but yeah, if I wanted to access puppies, I could go document.body children zero. But then what happens if I add, um, I don't know, it could be anything. What if I just add a navigation as my first thing? Everything would break if my code relied on this, because now the zeroth, I have to refresh the page. Now my zeroth, uh, that's really cool, the image updated. Uh, then now the zeroth element is actually navigation, not a header. OK, so the way we're actually looking at traversing the tree, if we were to use this to try and pinpoint specific elements, it would be very brittle. That's why there will be other ways. Uh, but the way things like um, what we're going to use work is they traverse the tree for us. So we're just going to use functions that do this kind of stuff for us, but in an intelligent way. Um, but let's take Darren's answer and see what happens. Because the question was, how do we access uh, this exact element in the list or any element in the list? We could go document.body, children2, maybe children3 now, uh, dot children one dot children whatever index you want in the LI. Which index should we do? Give me a number between like 0 and 7. 4. Which one will it be? Noki. Nailed it, Calgary. And I can even ask for like the. Uh, you know, I said that data thing and just did dot, dot, dot in my examples. Uh, some of the data that uh, some of these elements will have is like inner text. So I get the inner text from within the element. Um, OK, so any questions about traversing the tree here? Kind of going to the children, finding another child, going to that child, so on. Oh, cool. OK. Um, we can keep doing this basically forever, right? The, our, our trees can be infinitely uh, long, and we can traverse entire trees if we want. We can do really fancy stuff, which you'll learn about in week five. Um, but really, most of the time, we just want to be able to pinpoint a single element on the screen, right? Like, I want this header. I don't care that it's the first or second element within the document. I just want the header. Or I want to grab this entire list so I can do stuff to it. Or I want to grab the last item within that list, something like that. So we end up using uh, selectors for this. Um, so document object model, we already did traversal. I'll just paste the example in there. Um, whoops, traversal. But the next thing that we'll want to look at is selection. And there are a couple of different ways of selecting an element directly from within our document. And it's kind of similar to what we looked at yesterday. So if I want to select a specific element within my HTML page and style it with CSS, how would I do that? I could give it an ID or class, right? And then I can, uh, using that idea or class, access that specific element, give it a very specific style. And I can do the exact same thing in JavaScript, which is really, really handy and powerful. So like I said, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. The older ways are using document, uh, document get element by ID, or ID, uh, where you just pass it an ID of an element, and it will get you that specific element. Document dot get elements 
by class or by class name. Syntax might be slightly off with these, but the idea is still the same, uh, where you would give it a class name and it would uh, return all of the elements, so an HTML collection of all the elements you need, or with that name. Uh, but the more modern ways, the ways that we're going to be using it, uh, is to use document dot query selector and document dot query selector all. And the great thing about these methods, query selector and query selector all, is that we can pass in any CSS selector. So instead of having to find uh, just by a class name or just by an ID, I can write uh, things like I was writing yesterday, uh, maybe like every image with the class highlight or something. So any valid CSS selector can go in here. Most of the time, we will just write a single class or a single ID, whatever. Um, but any valid CSS selector, image, highlight, you know. Um, first child, right? Things like this. Any valid CSS selector is valid here, so it's really cool and powerful, yeah. Uh, yeah, CSS selectors, right? So I could just put in the tag name. It works the exact same way we're used to in CSS, so anything that's a valid CSS selector can go in here, which is really cool, and it's also how we use jQuery, which we'll find out about later. Um, so these methods are way more powerful and easier to use. You will see code that uses these, though, and it's similar. It just a little bit more specific, a little bit less uh, uh, generic. I don't want to use that word, but yeah, a little bit less powerful. Um, so I want to, let's try doing the exact same thing. Let's try grabbing certain elements. Document .get element by it. Yeah. That was two minutes ago. Way to close the lag, right? Like, even my script ignores Calgary for two minutes. I'm sorry. What's that? <sighs> Which is weird, because when I tested this out earlier, as long as the window was open, yeah, I got I to gotta write a better script. Um, I, I did this quickly last night. I tried. I'll, I'll, make, it better. I'll make it better for next, next lecture. <laughs> Cry. Oh, the good thing is it doesn't respond to Giphy's, which I like. Um, yeah, I'll figure out a way to make it better during the break, maybe. A for effort. I'll just leave it open all the time. Um, or I'll get a different laptop, plug it into, yeah, I'll figure it out, I'll figure it out. Uh, OK, let's quickly, let's, let's try selecting specific elements, then we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll do some really, really fancy stuff. So let's do a similar thing. Let's select uh, the header. Using the new methods, how can I select this specific header? Do I, first of all, do I want document.querySelector or document.querySelector all? Query selector. Query selector will return me a single element. Query selector all will return me uh, an HTML collection, which, as we've already discovered, is basically an array. Uh, so query selector, because I'm only trying to find a specific thing. If I wanted many things, query selector all. Uh, what shall I put in the query selector? Yeah, right. So right now, I only have one heading on the page, so I'll just put in h1. And this will get me my puppy's h1. But if I had multiple h1s on the screen, this wouldn't be a very good selector. So what else could I do to make this more specific? Uh, someone said it, but they said it quietly. Add class or ID to HTML. Add class or ID to HTML. I love that like, no matter how quiet they are in Calgary, it's so loud when they say anything over here. You're the loudest people in the room, Calgary. Um, yeah, uh, which one? Class or, class or ID? Why a class? Ooh, we don't like IDs when they increase specificity of CSS selectors, but this has nothing to do with CSS. So now we get to actually think about IDs and classes in the way that they're supposed to be thought about. Is this a very unique element, or are there many of these elements? Well, it's specific to the page, so even if we had these on multiple pages, that would be fine. But as long as it's unique within this page. And it kind of depends on how I think about it. Maybe I'm trying to grab all the headers, so I'm going to call this like main headers or something. But if I did want this to be a very specific thing, then it wouldn't be a bad idea to just say ID, uh, maybe page heading, or page header, whatever. 
and this is fine, and there's none of that weird specificity stuff that we have to think about, because this is for JavaScript. Maybe if I wanted to style this, I would add a class for styling, but you know, if I'm accessing it from JavaScript, there's, there's no bad, uh, there's no negative side to using an ID. It has to be unique, but like we already know that. So let's, oh yeah, so let's just give that a page heading. Um, let's refresh the page, because every time I update the HTML, I have to refresh the page. And instead of document.query selector h1, how do I access an ID? It's CSS selector? Hashtag page header, heading? Page heading, there we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, we can use these query selectors to access specific elements using classes, IDs, tags, whatever. Uh, all right, let's do something else. Let's grab uh, this list of things. Um, I am going to give this list an ID of potato list. Why not? Uh, so now I have a potato list. I know it's an unordered list or an ordered list, whatever. It's a list. Uh, so I can say document dot query selector, and we're just trying to get the single list, hashtag potato list. Um, that didn't work because I did not refresh the page first. That did not work because I didn't save my HTML before refreshing the page first. OK, so I got my potato list. Now I have uh, a object that has multiple children. So I could even go to the potato list and then say uh, children. And that gets me my HTML collection of all the list items. Or I could use the CSS query selector and define that I want the list items within the potato list. All right, increase that size a bit. Whoops. Oh, that's awful. Using the query selector completely. I can specify that I want it to first look for an item called potato list and then look for descendants of that. Maybe I could even say direct descendants that are list items. CSS selectors, whatever you prefer. Uh, why do I only get one element back? Like when I did it dot children, I got this uh, array of nine items. But when I did it with the query selector, I only got one item back. Query selector instead of query selector all. So don't let that catch you out. Query selector all, because I'm now trying to get every single list item. And there we go. It's the same outcome. So multiple ways of still being able to pinpoint a specific element, uh, but then maybe like get its children, or maybe get elements within that element. Uh, I will recommend doing it the selector way rather than ever typing dot children, uh, but both are valid. So any questions about selecting items, selecting specific items? Um, I could assign this to a variable. Just do this quickly. Uh, items equals this uh, for uh, var item of items console log item dot inner text. Grab all of the items as an HTML collection, loop through them, just console log the text from within each item. Not terribly useful at this point, but it's kind of showing you that, yeah, your JavaScript can interact with the page, interact with the elements. Um, so any questions about any of that? Nope, none. Cool, all right, so let's take a break. Uh, and when we get back, we'll actually, maybe we'll embed a form or something, and we'll detect when the user inputs like new potato ways, and then we'll add it in and maybe delete them and stuff like that. So we'll get, we'll get real fancy after the break. Um, Calgary, I'm going to leave the tab open, so if you post any messages, the hand will wave to everyone.
Okay, Calgary, let me know if you're good to go and can hear me. Calgary, let me know if you're good to go. This is great. I, I tried getting it set up to a different computer so that it would be faster, um, but I got stuck because I don't know what my password is to log into Slack. Shop. So I'm going to figure that out and in the breakout, we'll have a faster thing. Cool, I think that was Calgary. Yep, sweet. Let's do this then. Um, so, before the break, we did DOM traversal and DOM selection. Now I want to look uh, at manipulation, creation, and I really want to focus on events. Um, so actually we won't go into manipulation much. Uh, it's similar to what we've already done. This stuff is going to be the interesting stuff that we'll deal with now. Um, events, creating new ones. Um, but manipulation, uh, all I really mean by that is like we've already gone in here and selected elements and kind of seen what they are. Manipulation would be just updating them. So in the same way that I earlier went and what, document dot query selector um, page heading, yeah. How do I get? Nope. Don't know how to get to completion there. Um, to get it, and then once I've got it, I can access things like it's in a text. I can also change its inner text and change its styles and other things like that. I could add a class that completely changes how CSS styles it. So uh, just for simplicity, I'm just going to change the inner text. Uh, what should we change puppies to? Like kittens? Bill Murray photo of the day? I don't know. That, that, would, be, that would be too sensical. This is nonsensical. Um, yeah, so I'm going to run this. Watch what happens to puppies. Look at the heading. Kittens. So once we have the elements, we can do kind of whatever we want. And this is going to be a little bit of discovery for you today and over the next couple of days, like what you can do. Um, but in a really simple way, I can just update the text. One key thing to remember is that if I update the DOM in JavaScript, it doesn't affect the HTML file. So my HTML is still exactly the way it was, um, like my HTML file anyway. It still has the page with a heading puppies. So if I were to refresh this page, all of that data is gone. But while I'm here, I can manipulate it, right? Once the page is loaded, I can update the way it view, uh, the, yeah, update the way it's seen. Um, and if we do even look at the elements, we can see right now the browser is interpreting this as a header that has the name kittens. It just won't be persisted. This change will not uh, be within the HTML file itself. Uh, so with that said, let's change the way we're kind of doing things here. Right now, I've been writing all of my JavaScript in the console. But realistically, I want my JavaScript to exist in uh, a file, right? So it can load into the page and I can reuse it. Like no one's going to be typing their production JavaScript code in the console. So um, it's also make it easier to uh, respond to events when we get to that. So if I want to write some JavaScript in a JavaScript file for the browser, where do I start? The bottom of the page? <laughs> like right here? OK, so someone suggested I just start writing JavaScript right here before the closing body tag. So I can just script. Script. Um, so I can't just write JavaScript straight into my HTML. Like I can't write a console log there. Uh, but if I add a script tag, everything inside this script tag can be JavaScript or should be JavaScript. Just like everything in a p tag should be a paragraph, everything in a script tag should be JavaScript. This will now run. So if I just console log uh, some jazz hands, um, if I refresh this page now, we should see that get logged to the console. Whoops, zoomed on the wrong thing. Right, everyone see that? So 
So one question was, is that the equivalent of doing that angle bracket EJS thing, right? Angle bracket percent JavaScript, angle bracket, or percent angle, whatever, EJS, right? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Uh, no, it is not. Um, do not get confused with server-side templates and rendering. Uh, this is client-side JavaScript. This is JavaScript running within the browser. EJS was JavaScript running on the server, rendering HTML, and then giving the browser HTML with no JavaScript. Right now, we have HTML and we have JavaScript, and things can change on the fly. With EJS, you could change or like you could make this dynamic page just once, and then it would never change. Right, think about everything that you did in TinyApp. Yeah, you could dynamically render your HTML page, but once it was in the client, there was no changing it. The only way to change what anyone saw was to refresh the entire page by making a new HTTP request. This is JavaScript running within the browser, so things can just change on the fly however you want. Um, yeah, good question. And one other thing I'll bring up right now is that if I write a console log, and this is node code running on the server, I will open up a REPL. I will run the server code, and I will check in terminal whether that console log is actually logging anything out. If I see a console log within the browser or within my client-side code, I should be checking the browser for that console log. So right here, I wouldn't open up a terminal window. I would go to the browser, and I would view the console here. So try not to get confused with that. When you're running a console log on the client side, you're always going to look in the browser. All right, this, this code is running only within the browser. There's no code running on the server. So let's see. Uh, I've got my script tag. Why did you tell me to put it at the bottom of my page? Would it not work if I put it like at the top of my page? It would, but it would run it, it would run it immediately. So like, you had an alert. So it would run it immediately. That seems fine. Well, like, as opposed to like, if you put an alert, you like the header tag. Yeah, so someone suggested that if I put an alert. So you're suggesting that if I put an alert right here, so instead of a console log, I'm actually just going to change this to be an alert, which just displays this as an alert to the user rather than a console log in the, in the dev tools. Uh, and you even said put it in the header or in the head. That this is going to be bad. So let's see what will even happen here. If I refresh this. There's my alert. That's what an alert does. This page says jazz hands. Um, and the thing that we see to the left is our website. If Actually, let's just look at the HTML file. Every time an HTML file is loaded, it's loaded from top to bottom. So this line is evaluated before this line is evaluated before this line, before this line, everything else. So if we put in some code, some JavaScript, that uh, takes a while to load, like maybe it's uh, executing some HTTP request. Maybe we're actually loading in a JavaScript file from another server that's taking a while to get here. Maybe we have some really, really process-intensive JavaScript code, or maybe we have some blocking JavaScript code, like an alert. That is going to happen, and we have to wait until that code has finished doing what it's doing. And in the case of alert, that's clicking OK before any other line gets executed. Um, so one reason that we would always put our JavaScript at the bottom of the page is so that if anything happens, if there's a long process or anything else, uh, we can at least be looking. So I'll click OK, it will load. If I refresh the page now with the script at the bottom of the page, well, that didn't work the way I wanted it to. Did I save it? I did. Maybe an alert's a bad example. Yeah, alert still doesn't load the entire page for whatever reason. Let's do a different example. Uh, let's use debugger. So everything else I said is true, except for the fact that an alert seems to not want to act that way. Um, so what a debugger uh, tag does, and this is a really handy thing for you to know about as client-side web devs, uh, as soon as the browser hits this word within a script tag, it will stop everything and allow you to debug your code. So it says, OK, I'm going to stop the execution of all the HTML and JavaScript at this point, And you are now allowed to go into the console and evaluate local variables and things like that, which is really, really handy. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up right now is because it's completely stopped the execution of my code. So you could imagine that this is a really long running piece of JavaScript, or like I say, it's making an HTTP request that's taking a while, whatever. If I do this at the bottom of the page as the last thing, everything else will be loaded. then 
my code will come to a complete halt as the browser's like, all right, I'm stopping right here for you to evaluate stuff. If I change this into the head, at the bottom, everything loaded fine. I'm going to continue running the application. The image took a while to load because that's another HTTP request. Um, but if I refresh it now, there we go. Uh, if I refresh the page now, so I just like hitting enter to make sure I load the page, uh, it stops in the head and we get to see nothing. So the only things that have been loaded is everything before the debugger word, which is the metadata. So if we include JavaScript in the header, there's a chance that users won't be able to see our page for a while while everything in our JavaScript files loads. Whereas if we put it at the bottom, the users always get to see our nice website with all the HTML and CSS loaded. And then you know they can wait a second for the JavaScript to come in. So there it is with it at the bottom. At least I get to see my page now. OK, any questions about that? <laughs> yes, but we'll get to that maybe later on today. Um, the question was, can I, can I get my debugger only to execute once the image is loaded? And yes, uh, but we'll talk about that later on. Um, notice that, that that is a really interesting thing, though, right? That like if I load my HTML page, all the text loads just fine. If I had CSS, it would have loaded as well. Um, we get to my last little debugger line and everything stops executing. Why is the image not showing up? Yeah. Uh, so one answer was it's because it's pulling it from an outside source. Kind of. Why would that take a while? Yeah, so it doesn't matter if it's an outside source or an inside source, I guess. Um, every time there's an image tag, that's an HTTP request. So this line loads. This line makes an HTTP request. Then this stuff loads. It stops here. And by the time the image is actually done downloading, it gets displayed on the screen, which is kind of a cool thing to see happen. Exactly. Yeah, it's just making the request for the image, uh, which I'm pretty sure on older browsers, that was all synchronous. So like this wouldn't have loaded until the image loaded. But it seems to be asynchronous on modern browsers, which is kind of cool, um, but interesting stuff. Stuff you don't really think about, right? You're like, oh, I'm just loading a web page, and it's got these images that I included. But actually, every single time you include an image tag, that's another HTTP request. Uh, OK. So yeah, we put the JavaScript at the bottom of our file. Uh, do I want to write JavaScript in the same file as my HTML? Do I want to be writing my JavaScript here? I can, but I probably shouldn't. Where should I write my JavaScript code? In a JS file, yeah. So let's create a JS file. I'm going to call this, I don't know, scripts for now, generic name. So ideally, you want to put your JavaScript in a JavaScript file, just like you want to put your CSS in a CSS file. And just like we learned last week and the week before about good programming practices, separating things out into files and functions and all that stuff, it doesn't change now that we're writing client-side JavaScript. The code changes slightly, and the way we interact with users changes. But we should still be using all those best practices, breaking our code up into functions, using files, all that stuff. So I am going to, instead of writing JavaScript here, I still use a script tag. But instead of the script tag containing the JavaScript, it contains a link to my JavaScript file, which I've called scripts.js. And this isn't Node, so I don't do that relative path thing. And now it will still at the bottom of my page, but now it will load the JavaScript from a different file, which is nice. I have a, a clean slate to start coding. Let's just make sure everything still works. I'm going to console.log. Uh, cool. All right, so if I refresh my page, I should just see there. Cool, so my JavaScript file is linked up. Nice. Cool. Awesome. Um, let's. See, let's talk about events. Events are one of the main reasons that JavaScript was created, so that we could have client-side code respond to events. What do I mean by events? What are some examples of events? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so an event could be the page loading. Let's write these down. Yeah? Uh, on click, maybe the user clicks something. Clicks what? On click anything, like literally the user clicks anything on the page. Yeah, that could be an event that we'd want to respond to. What else? Uh, on hover, hovering what? Anything? Yeah, we might want to. We want to like do something. Key down event. Key down. Uh, we might want to wait for the user to hover their mouse over something. We might want to detect when uh, a key is pushed and then respond to that. It's all about. We don't want to write JavaScript code that happens right now. That'd be kind of pointless if we just like removed elements or updated elements immediately when the uh, when the page loaded, right? If I was just going to change uh, mouse enter mouse at the app. And I thought this would be distracting. Mouse stuff, because there are plenty. Um, if I wanted to change this from puppies to kittens immediately, I wouldn't do that in JavaScript. I would just change my HTML. The reason we have client-side JavaScript is so that we can respond to events, like when the user clicks something, or hovers over something, or keyboard events, or just like a certain amount of, t of time has elapsed, or something. The reason we have client-side JavaScript is so we can respond to events. They can be browser events, like the page loading, or the page being closed, or the page being, uh, I don't know what it's called. I think it's blurred when that happens. Like, you, you go away from a page. So like if you were having a game, you'd pause the game. And this is like focusing the page. Um, but yeah, you want to be able to respond to events for so many different reasons. Um, I did just think, does everyone know? Oh, can I not go to this? Yes, I can. Does anyone know about the burp and fart piano? So when when I think like uh, usually when I do this lecture, I'm just thinking of like very uh, boot camp style things. Like um, we click a form for a tiny URL and we like submit that, or we enter some text for a tweeter like app and we submit that. But really, events can be anything, including click events or keyboard events. This is a piano website that plays a burp and fart piano made by someone really really awesome, uh, but this is one reason why you might want to detect click events on the client side. Because this couldn't be done with HTTP requests. You have to be accepting user input and like dynamically doing something with that, like playing sound effects, um, like burp sounds or <coughs> fart sounds. Um, this used to have musical typing, too, so you could do keyboard events. But I don't think, yeah, I think the person who made it got rid of that for some reason. No idea why. Um, anyway, I just want to show you right, burps and farts. Because this is what the web is now. It was originally designed to be like an amazing Wikipedia type thing. And it's cat images and burps and farts. On one, end, uh, yeah. on one end, you've got Wikipedia. And on the other end, some asshole made this. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, some websites uh, benefit from having this dynamic side to them, making them more responsive, making single page applications like what we're building today, some web apps wouldn't be able to exist without it. So some just benefit. Like Twitter could exist without it, but this couldn't exist without it. So sometimes it's just a nice to have. Sometimes your whole app will depend on client-side JavaScript. Um, anyway, let's respond to an event. Let's, let's do something pretty common. We're going to add a form at the bottom of this. And people will be allowed to input their favorite potato types, I guess. Yeah. Um, and when they input it in the form, instead of making an HTTP request, we'll just add it to the bottom of the list. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a form. Um, that actually doesn't matter. I don't need an action. I don't need to specify much. I'm just creating a form. Inside the form, I will have an input. What's my type of input? Text. What shall I name my input? Potato. What should I give it an ID of? Potato text. I don't know. Input. Um, I need a button. Uh, what should be like the save word for potatoes? Is there a punny word? Huh? Hash? Oh, mash. Plant. Yeah, I know. I like mash. I like mash. Uh, uh, what should I have for a, I can't think of the question, but the answer is we should have a label. Um, Ooh, I want this label to apply to this input. What do I put in the for thing? The for. Does for link to type, name, or ID? Raise your hand if you think that I. 
ID. Uh, raise your hand if you think it's name. So in here, I should say label for potato. Raise it, raise it high. OK, raise your hand if you think it's ID, potato text. A couple. Raise your hand if you didn't raise your hand for either of those things. Oh, we got like, they still didn't raise their hand. <laughs> people in the back of the room like anyway sorry um, I'll stop I'll stop uh, picking on people uh, for relates to ID this is important don't let this trip you up this label is for the input with this ID with this ID right for an ID they link up the name is only for when you submit a form when I submit a form whether it's to a server or whether I'm picking up the data locally using JavaScript the name is going to be the key and the actual input is going to be the value. And that's how I use the data. So give me the potato value for this form. It's going to be whatever I input into the field. The ID is just for local use. Uh, and in this case, it will link up the label to this input. Um, so Calgary nailed it. <coughs> ID. Um, this is commonly misunderstood, that people like link them up incorrectly. But you'll see people doing stuff like this, because they're like, oh, I don't actually know which one it is, so I'm just going to name everything potato. And this works, but like, don't do it. Uh, OK, so I have my form. What's it? I don't know. Who's they? Whatever. I think we're used to the fact that like mentors and instructors give different ad advice from the curriculum. Uh, some of it's opinionated. Anyway, let's not get into that. I would suggest using different things, because uh, the reason for this to exist and change is slightly different from the reason of this to exist and change. Like, this is tightly coupled to probably your server, and this is not. Um, OK, let's do some stuff. So if I have that form, I click the button. I want to detect when the user is actually submitting this form. What event am I listening for on this form? So I might look for a on-click event on the submit button, right? So if I click the mash button, let's respond to that event. What happens if the user enters, oh, I didn't put anything in the label. That was dumb of me. Potato. What if someone comes into this form and isn't using a mouse and happens to get into the form, types something in, hits enter? Am I also listening for a key down event or a key up event or a key press event? On the form, on the button, on the input? What happens if uh, I got a futuristic one um, where I just tell Siri to input something into the form and submit it? Am I listening for an on Siri event? To be very intentional about this event, do I care if the button is clicked or do I care about something else? The field is filled, but not necessarily if it's just been like, this is filled. One other thing has to happen. I have to submit the form. So I don't care how you submit the form. I just need to know when the form is being submitted. So the event that I'm listening for, and the, the click would have worked uh, if I did it on the button as long as everyone clicked the button. But the event I am actually interested in is the submit event. So you have to be intentional with your events that you're using. Um, so before I can attach an event to this form, I have to first find the form. How shall I find the form? How do I grab the form from the DOM tree? <coughs> Document dot. Nope. Not, not the hard way, the easy way. Query selector, uh, I guess I could use form. Um, or I'm going to be a little bit better, and I'm going to give this an ID. Um, and I'm going to say uh, potato form, just in case I added multiple forms to my HTML. Uh, so we're going to go query selector, hashtag potato form. And I'll say this is a variable. I've been switching between like Vala and Const all day today. Uh, const potato form equals. OK, so I do this once when the page uh, loads, and then I can access this form from wherever. So I need to now listen for that submit event. How do you think I listen for an event on an object? I add an event listener to that object. So I can take any DOM, DOM node, DOM object, uh, and add an event listener. And in this case, I'm listening for the submit event. So we call this function. We pass in the event we want to listen for. And then we pass in a callback function. Uh, 
which can be a fat arrow function, but I would actually suggest using a normal function because there will be occasions where you want to access this from within the function. So I'm going to do it as a normal function. You can make your own mind up. Sam suggests doing it this way. Uh, and this function gives us an event object. OK. So we add an event listener. It's a submit event. We give it a callback function. That function gives us an event object. So before we go any further, I just want to know more about the event object. So I'm going to console log event. Yes. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, so uh, the question was like, submit is like a built-in thing, and it's not because we've like called a button submit or done something special anywhere else. No, uh, you can name anything whatever you want. I actually managed to not name anything submit there. The submit is a type of event, and it's built in. Uh, and actually, I should bring that up. Let's look at um, uh, browser events. Uh, event reference that looks like it might be good. Uh, let's see if we, yeah. Wow, we have got all the events. Let's see if there's click. Just want to make sure I'm in the right place. Yep, click, double click. Wow. Uh, so I'll, I'll put this in the notes, lecture notes as well. But these are all of the events that exist by default. And you can even create your own events. Uh, but these all exist so we can like check for blur and focus. We can check for click and double click and uh, mouse up and all that stuff. So this is a list of, you know, there's a few events that you can choose from. Um, so, some get thumbs down. Um, yeah, you can do crazy stuff. With, you, you're so unlimited once you start like realizing what events you can respond to and what you can actually do with the DOM um, that it's not surprising that like some of these amazing websites do so much and that Flash is no longer needed. Remember when websites used to be Flash? Yeah, that's because JavaScript wasn't that great back then. Uh, OK, so we have a submit event. I want to console log the event. We're going to see some weird thing happen. Um, and we'll fix it in a moment. But if I refresh this page and I type something in here and hit enter, what are we expecting to happen with the code we've written so far? We really want to see the event in the console here. So I've typed in, let's type in something real. What's, what's going to be a nice potato that we're going to add? Hot potato? Uh, and I'm going to click mash or hit enter, whatever. Uh, we want to see the event on the right, but look what actually happens. What actually happened? It refreshed the page, right? Why the hell did it refresh the page? Also, why is there a hot potato in my URL? Something everyone will do at some point in their JavaScript career and be like, what? Oh, right, that thing. Why did this happen? It's the query parameter. What is the default behavior of a form in HTML? Not post. We make it post by typing in post in the method uh, uh, attribute. But the default behavior of a form is to make a get request and to take all the data from the form and make key value pairs within the URL. We have a potato input. The value was hot, so we got a key value pair in the URL. This is the default behavior of a form. The default behavior of a link is to go to a new page, right? make a new get request to a new page. So if I had a link in this page, even if I was looking for like a click event on that link, the default behavior would take me to a different page. Default of behavior of a form is getting in the way of my JavaScript here. Occasionally, you will run in, actually a lot of the time, you will run in situations where the default behavior of something is getting in your way. So before we can write any JavaScript, we need to prevent that default behavior. And when we're using events, we can just grab the uh, event object and call the prevent default method on it. So whatever HTML was going to do, whatever the browser was wanting to do in this case, don't do that. I'm going to completely take over and do my own thing. So first thing we do, prevent the default behavior, and then we'll do our own behavior. So now if I refresh the page, type in hot, and enter, there we go. The First thing, first thing that happened was the default behavior was prevented. Then we get uh, the event object. 
An event object's a pretty big object that has a lot of useful things. One of the things is prevent default. Uh, some other things are like about bubbling, um, targets, and there's a lot more methods. Pretty cool object. I think it's in one of the readings today. But this will give you any piece of information that you should need while handling this event should be included in the event object. Like what exactly was clicked. And if there were uh, other elements like above or below it that were clicked or submitted or anything else. Where it, like the mouse's uh, x and y values should be in here somewhere if it was a click event. If it, or if the submit was done through a click. Yeah, go ahead. What if we want an event to only happen once, then move on to a different event? What do you mean? OK, so what if you wanted an event that when you submit, it adds, then the next time it takes away? Yeah. Uh, well, it's still a submit event. So you're still going to leave the submit event, but you're in JavaScript, right? So you could just create a variable that's like, if it was the first time, do this, else second time, do this. Um, so like that's another thing to remember. Damn it. We have these events, but we're still writing JavaScript. So whatever I can do with JavaScript, whatever logic I can write, I can write within here. Ifs, while loops, objects, whatever. Functions. Cool. Any questions? No? OK. So um, we've prevented the default behavior. Got this event object, which is pretty cool. I'll let you read about that on your own time. Uh, let's do the really thing that I want to do right now, which is take that text and put it into the list. So how can I grab the text that is currently being input into this form? How can I grab that data from the DOM? Uh, yeah, like document query selector for the form. Is that what you're talking about? Or, or I could like traverse the DOM. Well, one way that we've already looked at, so like why not do it this way, uh, would be to grab this element, maybe document query selector for this element, and then grab the value of that element. Just like we did when we wanted to grab the text of puppies, let's do the same but for this element. So how shall I grab this element? Well, first I would grab it, I could use an ID. And actually, an ID would make sense since I already gave this thing an ID earlier. So I'll just use the ID. All right, we already know how to do this. So my input has an ID of potato text. So maybe right here, I'll say document.querySelector. Not all, just because I'm going for a single thing. Uh, how do I specify the potato text? Hashtag potato text. So this is my element. How do I get the value? I wish. I wish there was a consistent API. But no, these things have inner text. This is a form input, so it has a value. Don't worry, you'll get used to all the different things. You'll try inner text, it won't work. So then like, actually the best thing you can do, I'm doing this wrong, is instead of writing JavaScript in your file and then like refreshing the page and testing it there, Test your code here in the console, in the dev tools. Once you know your code works, then put it into your file. So first, I'm just going to run this code to make sure what happens, what I think will happen happens. And yeah, it does, in fact, grab that input. Um, if I was going to go with the first suggestion, I would try in a, in a text. What does in a text get me? Nothing. Empty string. Hmm. Maybe I'd Google, maybe I'd ask a friend, or maybe I'd just like start guessing random words. Uh, either way, I'd probably end up at value at some point. There is the string I want. So now that I have that, I know that is the way I can get the text. I'm going to take that code back into my JavaScript file. And I'm going to call this uh, new potato text. OK, so this is the text that I'm going to put into the form. How do I now put that into uh, sorry, the list? How do I now put that into this list? Yeah? 
so let's actually break this down into a couple of steps. Um, one of the steps, and this is part of it already, is to create the new list element. Then I need to find the list to add it to, and then I need to add it to the list. So the first thing is to create the new list item. We already have the text. The way we create a new item, does anyone remember? How do I create a brand new DOM node out of the blue? I said it like once briefly in the middle of like a sentence that had other important information in it. You guys don't remember? No? OK. It's document.create. Append child element. Um, yeah, a pen child will get to that here. A pen child will be part of the last step. Uh, so we can create a new element by saying document.create element and then passing in the type of element I want to create. I want to create a list item, so I will pass in li. Create me this type of element. Then I can manipulate the element however I want, so I'm going to say list item. Dot, what do I want to change about this list item? Yeah, right, the text. So this is one way of modifying the text, new potato text. So I now have this new element, a list item with the text of new potato text. Where does this node exist in the tree? I've created a brand new node, brand new list item. Where does it exist? The unordered list does, yeah. So we can grab that, but where does this exist right now without doing anything else? It's a node just like every other DOM node, but it isn't attached to the tree yet. So that tree I drew out, uh, if a node exists within that tree, it's visible on the screen. If it's not within that tree, it exists. It's still taking up memory, but no one can see it. So we've created a node, but we still need to add it to the list. Uh, the first thing we need to do is find the list to add it to. Did we give that list an ID? We did. Look at that. Potato list. Look, I'm. So inconsistent today between var const and let and between camel casing and snake casing. I'm going to be more consistent. Potato list. OK. Uh, find the potato list. OK, how am I going to find this? What method am I going to use? Yep, document.query selector. Hashtag potato list. I like using potatoes. Const potato list. Cool. Uh, and then, as someone in Calgary said, we are going to use append child. I actually didn't see who it was. I just heard who it was. That's kind of fun. Potato list, append child, uh, list item. OK, decent amount of code there. Let's walk through it. Uh, the form is submitted. We prevent the default behavior and completely take over doing our own thing. We create a brand new list item element using the value from the form. We then find the potato list so that we can add a new child element to that list. So let's run this code and see if it all works. Uh, so I'll refresh, come down here, type in hot, click mash, and hot appeared there. I keep doing this. What else shall I append in there? Baked potato. I'm going to hit enter this time. What else? It's like jazz hands. So what would have happened if you got rid of that uh, prevent default? Uh, if I got rid of that prevent default, it would do what we saw before, where a get request happened and nothing, none of this code gets run. Well, I mean, technically, all of this would get run, but the page would refresh before we actually saw anything meaningful happen. So it would just be like a quick flash, and nothing that we want to happen would happen. How would I append the item onto? Oh, uh, like how would I add it as a to the top of the list? Yeah. Uh, so instead of appending, I could potato list prepend list item. Hope this works. Uh, what's going to happen when I refresh the page now, though? I'll lose everything, right? Because all of this dynamic stuff done by JavaScript isn't persisted anywhere. 
Later on, we can write code to maybe respond to HTTP requests that this could do behind the scenes. We'll learn about that tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I'm going to lose everything. Uh, so let's add another hot potato, hit enter, and it adds it to the top. So we have prepend and append, and I think, as I remember now, um, append child, I think, is the old way of doing it. You just write append. But what happens if we append it and prepend it? Will we get two elements, two DOM nodes, or will it exist once, one place? Or will it crash? So we prepended hot, and then we couldn't, oh no, we appended hot, and then we prepended it. But still only one item exists. I create multiple items, and then have it go both top and bottom, but I would have to create multiple nodes, right? Because new nodes won't just get created out of the blue unless I explicitly create them. And one single node was created, that's all. All right, how's Calgary doing? Any questions? Vancouver, any questions? Let's see. Creation. Uh, document dot create element. Uh, and I already went over the debugger. I think I managed to get to everything. And we're within time. Didn't even have to rush. Look at that. Cool. Everyone feeling good? Yeah? Ready to do the day's assignments? And then have a breakout on jQuery later? Cool. Anything from Calgary? Can you at least just give me a message so the hand waves? i got to wait for the message. Yeah. Bye. High five. One more time. Uh, yeah, yesterday I said don't create too many IDs because you didn't want to unnecessarily increase specificity within CSS. Now, oh, you can't write the same message twice, otherwise it doesn't work. Today, Down low. Too slow. <laughs> Um, today, uh, you want to use IDs and classes in the way that you originally learned about IDs and classes. If something is unique, use an ID, and if there are many of those things, use classes. Because when you're selecting uh, elements using IDs and classes from JavaScript, there's nothing to do with specificity. So you don't, uh, like, because you selected this way here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Same document, but yeah, uh, use IDs as much as you want, as long as they're unique things. Um, but my suggestion would be, you know, don't style them with the IDs. Just use that ID to select them from JavaScript, and then use classes if you need styling. So um, yeah, it is a little bit different when you select them from JavaScript in that way. All right, cool. Everyone happy? Can someone else give me a high five? I mean, a, a digital high. This is great. Imagine if you were super lonely, you could just set up one of these to always like high five. It's like, yeah, I'm the man. Who's the man? And then it would say, you're the man, and it would point to you. Anyway, all right, bye, everyone. <laughs> you can't send the same message twice because I wrote bad code. <laughs>